My brother received a racket for his high school graduation. I asked him if I could use it to play. He says, okay. And I grabbed the racket and the balls and I was ready to go hit the ball against the barn. And he said, you can't have the ball. So I found a ball when we were at a park and I didn't know they had tennis courts there. I hit the ball against the wall for about a month short of five years before my feet ever touched a tennis court. Um, 1956, I saw somebody, it was Althea Gibson's who it was. She was playing tennis on television and I can still to this day see her beautiful tennis motion. And all I just just close my eyes and I see it on this little bitty screen that wasn't as big as my computer. When I went to college, I was able to play. I went to Butler University. I got my degree in physical education. During that time, one of the teachers asked me, she says, um, I'm gonna be out of town. Would you take my place one day in a class? That was the first time I ever taught tennis. I never had a lesson. It was all just self-taught. Hit the ball against the wall. Question, can you see the ball? It's their racket. Do you see the ball? I was the first intercollegiate tennis coach at Indiana Westland. A few years later, had degrees, would travel. Got the job at Biola, and they asked me to develop a tennis program. And it was at that particular moment that I met a guy named Brad Parks. Brad Parks, no one's ever proved whether true champions are born or made, but you've proved that once a champion, always a champion. With the unwavering faith that has guided you since childhood, you've given your life, a life touched by personal tragedy, a very special purpose, to give encouragement and hope and a new lease on life to more than 20 million Americans who are disabled and who might just as easily give up. Brad introduced us to tennis, says, if you know anybody in a wheelchair, get them started playing tennis. been a step-by-step -step process. Uh, we, I didn't know anything about wheelchair tennis. One of the questions that I'll ask a player is how long you've been in the chair. And they'll, they'll point blank tell me I've been in the chair of such and such. And I'll say hey, what level of injury. That's important for me to know. And like a quad, I need to know that because of the fact that they don't sweat. You know, they spray water on them so that they don't get too hot on a hot day. And then it's cold really bothers most quads if it's really, really cold. Just like I was self-taught in tennis, I'm kind of self-taught in terms of working with this population. Wheelchair tennis is a technical and tactical sport, very similar to its Olympic counterpart, and is played by athletes in more than 100 countries. The most significant difference to Olympic tennis is the two-bounce rule, whereby a player can allow the ball to bounce twice and must return it before a third bounce. There are three things about wheelchair tennis that are different. One, you can have two bounces. Second thing is, in a chair, you can't move laterally, where a stand-up player can move laterally. And finally, with the um, wheelchair players, you gotta get to the ball. ball, and you're moving, and the ball's moving in a different direction. So, so you can't prepare early <laughs> to play from wheelchairs. I always try to teach people that, you know, after every point, you've got to let that point go. It's just like life. It's like Christy gets hurt in an accident. Well, she just moved forward. I'd never played tennis in my entire life, and all of a sudden I ran into Dee one day on campus, and she says, hey, do you want to play tennis? And I went, sure. So when I started looking at colleges, uh, the first place I looked at Biola because my dad is an alumni of Biola. Well, then the problem was is Biola had never had a handicapped student live on campus, ever before. They had to look at my class schedule every year and see where my classes were going to be so they could make sure that my classes were all downstairs because none of the buildings had elevators. As long as you have a, a positive attitude of saying, you know, let's just make it work. You know, we're going to do whatever we need to do to make it work 
is you'll be surprised how much you can do, how much you can participate in. I've been in a wheelchair for 31 years. That's a really long time. My value as a disabled person is never based on what I can do or accomplish. It's based on who made me and, and who I belong to. It's, it, and so that's what's so cool about any kind of sport that, or any kind of activity as a disabled person that allows me to meet other people is because that's what shocks people is that, that why, wait a minute, you're disabled and why are you happy? Why, why are you not depressed? Why are you, you know, upset about, you know, not mad about to the world that, you know, life's not fair? And, and it's, it's one of those things that I, I tell people all the time is, is it a bigger miracle to heal someone or is it a bigger, bigger miracle to give them joy in the middle of not healing? Our joy doesn't have to be based on, on our circumstances. And, and God is so much bigger than that. When you look at tennis, tennis is just a miniature life situation. There's a chance to cheat and there's a chance to be cheated. It's how you deal with that that makes a difference. You're dealing with frustrations, dealing with disappointments, dealing with people that cheat. Those are all things that, that you're going to face on a tennis court. And there's things you're going to face in life. Oh, I've lost so many matches in a row. I just feel like giving up. Well, hey, you know what? Everybody feels like giving up sometime. Well, you just got to put one foot in front of the other. Just got to keep moving. Got to be thinking about something. I think, you know, the fact that you have hope in heaven really makes a difference. What can I be doing here on earth so that my living will not be in vain?